Somehow we made it on time. It's good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Material Issues. <laughs> and we are having some issues, but hey, it's 9 o'clock, episode number 3, Wednesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 o'clock Pacific Time. I'm Mark Hirschberger of Pop Detective Records. So happy to be with you tonight. I'd like to introduce my good friend, Mr. David Bash. Hi, everyone. Mark, can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you. I can see you. Maybe we'll give a brief description. Mr. Bash has had a power outage all day. So things at his residence, including charging his, his uh, electronic gear, have been messed up. So our connection is a little bit rough. If we lose David, we may come back again tomorrow night or Sunday or something, we'll do an episode three before next Wednesday. So uh, keep tuning in. Make sure you uh, you comment. Let us know you're here because it's another night of material issues. David, what's on your mind before we lose any power? Well, lots of things. So first one is if, you, if people are wondering why I have a little gap right here, uh, is there, are you hearing me? Yes. If I go uh, like this, if you see me going like this, then you're you're great. Okay. Um, what if I see you going like that? <laughs> then you better log off. <laughs> you bet. Anyway, everyone, I was in a record store yesterday, and uh, some kid comes up to me and he says, "You're David Bash, aren't you?" And I usually answer yes to that question. <laughs> He said, I've seen you on your podcast, and I, I, I got to tell you, I have a bone to pick with you. You, you said that KISS wasn't power pop, and they are. <laughs> and I said, to, I said to the kid, oh, yeah? What are you going to do about it? And he gave me a sock right in the kisser. Right, Knocked yeah. out two teeth. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah. But when yeah. all was said and done, you should have seen the other guy. That's all now, I have to say. Did you call his eighth grade teacher and explain to him what happened? Uh, I didn't have to because his mom was there. <laughs> and she, and she, she gave it to me good. And well, so, she yelled at me. <laughs> okay. Well, we got somebody, yeah, some people leaving denial. some comments. Uh, someone's laughing here. Um, again, so if you're not a... If you're not a member of StreamYard, it's, we, we can't see who's actually leaving a comment. So uh, if you'd like to be recognized, we'd love just type your name in and say, hey, it's it's uh, the eighth grader's mom from the record store today. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully my, my connection will stay OK because uh, I'm, I'm using data here. There's no Wi-Fi because the power's out. Um, hello, whoever hey, you George. are. Thank hey, you. George. George Evans c clocking in. Yeah. Nice to say hey, hi George. to George. Hey, George. Good to see you. It's not nice. Yes, indeed. Somebody's here. Okay. Anyway, uh, when we started this and I said, uh, "If can you hear me? Can you see me? It reminded me of one of the most ignominious moments on television. Me being when Andy Williams hosted the 1977 Grammys. Now, he had hosted every Grammy Awards from 1970 through 77. There's a reason he didn't host them after 1977. And as I remember this, and, and I, I watched this live, and it's, what is it now, 45 years ago, um, or 44 years ago. So I could be wrong, but uh, they were trying to hook up a live feed with Stevie, with Stevie Wonder, who had won about... 15 Grammys for Songs in the Key of Life. Uh, so they're trying to do a live feed. He was in some African country. I think it was Angola. I, it may have been Uganda. It may have been Chad or Jeremy. I have no idea. <laughs> but Yeah, the, the rare country anyway, of Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're trying to... So they're trying to do... They're trying to do the hookup. And you, we can... We can see Stevie, and he's he clearly has no idea what's going on. Uh, he, <laughs> and uh, Andy says, Andy Williams says, hey, Stevie, can you hear me? No response. Stevie's doing a Stevie Wonder kind of, you know, head roll thing. Yeah. And uh, then Andy says, well, if you can't hear me, can you see me? 
My jaw must have hit the floor. I could not believe what he had just said. And thank God Steve didn't he hear that either because they went to commercial immediately. And when they came back, Andy had some feeble response like, when I said that, I didn't mean Stevie. I meant the people of Angola. It's like, Sh sure you did, Andy. Why don't you just admit that, you, you know, it, it, it was an honest mistake. It's one anyone could make just because it was in front of 20 billion people. 20 and billion everyone, people. everyone at the network had a conniption, you know, just because of that. <laughs> doesn't mean that you can't <laughs> own up to your mistake. Can't own up well, to it, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he ever did, but I do know that he never did a Grammy Awards after that. So well, make the of moral, that what you will. The moral of the story, you marry Claudine Langer, you lose your mind. Or you right? get shot, either one. Or you get shot by Spider, what was his name? Spider? Spider Savage. Spider Savage, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's who she shot. Oh, wait, Alleg oh, wait. did she allegedly... Who shot Spider? Sure, why not? We ha we have to be careful on this show. We don't yeah. you know, we don't want to we don't want to have charges brought against us. So we no, always no. Want to use the word allegedly. Allegedly, allegedly. So, you know, and amazingly, she hasn't been heard from. She's still alive, but she hasn't been heard from in like thirty years or forty years. I don't know. I I, I you know no, I, 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 I used to love Andy I, Williams. I was a huge Andy Williams fan. You know, uh, his um. It, if Steve Snee is watching, he's a gargantuan Andy Williams fan. Uh, yeah. uh, I think he has every one of his albums wow. on CD, of course, because on CD. Steve Snee don't do no vinyl. I don't. I don't think he's done <laughs> vinyl for fifty years now. But anyway, well, he's the he's the CD junkie, right? Yeah, he, yeah. he's a, among many things. He has hmm. about fifteen different video things going. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, it's all Artist good. Working man in podcast business, absolutely. He is. Yeah. Hey, one thing. One thing I wanted to bring up because we keep forgetting to bring it up, but you know, we we pop up the opening the opening segment here. We've got our uh, material issues overlay brand. Here we are. What we don't have is like a little jingle. We don't have a an opening ten second salvo. That would it would be, wouldn't it be great to have like a like a power poppy kind of intro to material issues it would be swell i think it would be fantastic uh unfortunately yeah. i don't i don't have you know the band behind me to do that and what we need is anybody who is a fan or friend or whatever of material issues if you'd like to put together something and send it to us let us know and uh maybe we'll pick one of these these great fans friends uh, music little clips and use it and we'll give them credit on our uh, live stuff on the podcast. As a matter of fact, this is available audio only on Podbean as a podcast. So if you can't watch the live archive, you can always tune in on Podbean and find Material Issues podcast and listen to the audio. You know, if you're tired of looking at these mugs, you know, especially Speak. after Dave's so, fight. Yeah. yeah. All right, I I might I may as well own up to it. I didn't get into a fight. So for those of you who are horrified by the thought, the very thought of me hitting a defenseless thirteen-year-old kid, uh, didn't happen. What did happen is I have a partial denture on, on the top of uh, on the top row, and a couple of the teeth came out. I'm going to see my dentist tomorrow, and hopefully all will be well. But the show yeah. must go on. And I was the not. Show must go I on. wasn't going to back out of the show because I look like Bobby Clark. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it just, it's it just wasn't going to happen. Either Bobby Clark or somebody from way back in the mountains. <laughs> is but that the, yeah, the amazing you thing is that you can't even say that anymore. Probably no, no, probably not. The amazing thing is, is where you that is that we're even you know we're even on here and live because not only did you have the issue with the, the teeth. But we get you had a power outage going on all day, and uh, thing that's really messed things up. And we were really skin of our teeth two minutes before going live. We were like, "Is this working? Is this working?" And then boom, we're here. So, yeah. right. Every and everybody, we thank anybody who's tuning in and watching. And if you want to leave a comment, type in your name. Let us know who's here and say hi. 
any questions, any uh, any funny things you want to you want to yell at us, we appreciate it. We really love everybody tuning in, and uh, um, that'd be great. Another question I got for you, Dave. I just David, I just saw uh, online the other day an old Jackson Five clip where they're singing ABC on Mike, Mike Douglas show or something like that. Do you think they would have been better served if like Tito and the other guy weren't faking like their guitars were plugged in and it could actually dance well with everybody else <laughs> because they were always kind of a step behind because they were trying to play their guitar and, and do the same thing, you know, at the same time. I thought I thought you were going to ask me if if Michael actually did it, and uh, I'm sorry to say, yeah, I think he did. When he when he no, sang, I'll be allegedly. there. He wasn't kidding. I'll tell you. When he said, "I want you back," well, we won't go. We won't go there. Uh, I, I I absolutely love the Jackson Five, and yep. one of the first shows I ever saw live was uh, the Jackson Five at a, at a theater in the round. So it was very cool. The stage was oh, wow. was uh, circling around. They were awesome. And uh, let me tell you, they could play their own instruments. So, oh, really? You know, yeah. Tito was a hell of a guitarist. And, uh, yeah, he, he, I mean, yeah, he was, he was hot. Um, but it was funny. Well, uh, uh, Janet Jackson came, was at that show, too, and she was flirting with Ralph Carter. It was kind of sweet. Oh, oh nice. But I always thought it funny when they were when they were singing because it seemed like you know Michael was singing live. I don't know if everything else was taped back in those days. Many of the artists would lip sync on those early programs in the early seventies. But the fact that you know they were dancing with their guitars and acting like they were playing the guitars didn't even have a chord on them. It wasn't right. It was before cordless technology, you know. And it's kind of the same thing with the Osmonds. The Osmonds you'd see live live videos of these guys and they were trying to drum but they had a full band behind them with like four guitars a bass drums everything and yet they also had their guitars on and you obviously couldn't hear them at all as far as their their instruments but it, i always said well you know they're better they're better when it's just the five of them dancing with the choreography all together than two of them trying to dance with the guitar in their hands you know just get rid right. of it you don't need it <laughs> it's a crutch. It's a crutch. <laughs> uh, but the, th the funny thing there too is that they could play also. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, I don't know how yeah. great Donnie really was on the keyboard, but no. you know, that was all, all he could. All he could do was do that that elbow across the thing where he would go. Bring, and that's yeah, all he I, did. I, <laughs> Alan could play. A, Alan could play a pretty hot guitar too, and they wanted to yeah. do that. You know. Yeah, and if yeah. you listen to the album "Crazy Horses," yeah. which I believe they played a lot, a lot of the instruments, if not all of them, yeah, they could have been, they could have been a rock band if they wanted to. And uh, Meryl right, Osmond sure. could have, Meryl Osmond could have sung with really almost every any cool band you could think of in the early seventies. You know, if it wasn't Great for voice. his image and and you know family ties, yeah, I mean, you know. He he would have been able to do it. He was a great soul singer, and he could rock. Yeah, no, um, they were uh, they were almost they were almost as good as the DeFranco family. I mean, really close. Hey, Tony's a Facebook friend of mine. Don't be dissing him. <laughs> Tony man. is great. They're from Jersey. Yeah, what the heck? They're from the, Canada. DeFranco. Actually, sorry. Well, I guess they they moved down to Jersey, didn't they? Because. The, they live, they live, Maybe they uh, did. Maybe they lived there for a while. I think they but, did. Uh, yeah, originally Canadian. Oh, okay. I, I know. I'm pretty sure that when they recorded "Heartbeat Is a Love Beat," they were living in L.A. at that point. But okay. Uh, right. Yeah, they're of Canadian origin. Well, that's uh, pretty funny stuff, though. I mean, oh, I yeah. miss that era. I miss that era. Yeah. What else you got going on, that man? That kind of reminds me. I, I just finished a series that's on Apple TV called 1971. Um, a lot of people have been posting about this on Facebook. Um, it's pretty cool. It's mainly about the music of the time. And, you know, in, almost as a backdrop, they're talking politics, the war, um, you know, racism, gay rights, all of that kind of stuff. But it's, it's a lot about the music. Bowie seems to be the most central figure, but you've also got Alice Cooper in there and uh, Marvin Gaye and... Uh, a few other a few other acts are mm -hmm. either prominent or you know just as part of the litany but 
it's uh, it's a pretty cool show. The interesting thing to me, which nobody else is going to give a damn about, is I'm pretty sure the show it was done in England, which means that when it comes over here, the uh, because of the different um, the different uh, frequencies that they use to broadcast things, um, it's it's got a, a different number of frames per second. So oh. what we what you get often when that happens is a really really slow. Uh, it, it it comes out to appear very very slow on our end, just like when we uh, when when the UK watches films that are done here, uh, it's about four percent fast. Now oh, it okay. wasn't four percent slow, thank God, but I think in trying to adjust it, they didn't quite get it right, and the soundtrack sounded just a little bit slow. I'm very sensitive to pitch, so I picked that up. Uh, it right, sounded yeah. slow and it felt slow, but beyond that, it's a, it's it's definitely worth watching. I uh, I dug it. And it's a it's a, it's like a mini series or it's a series. Uh... Eight, eight eight episodes. Eight episodes. Okay. Um, you know, going through going through those topics with you know how music basically how music in, intertwined with a lot of the different social. And political things that were going on during the time, and uh, certainly, you know, I would say you know, that time from the late '60s into the early '70s, there's never been more of a time where music had as much profound effect on uh, on our social structure, and vice versa. I mean, think about yeah. it. Think of all the protest songs that came out of that era. Uh, sure. Just or think about the songs just lamenting different things that were going on. Um, it, it was uh, like what's going on, for example. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, certainly that's certainly lamenting the state, of, you know, the state of the country and the state of the world. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it it was I was just a little bit too young at that time to get it all, but it, you know, late sixties, early seventies, um, without a doubt, uh, that music is so profoundly uh, intertwined with with uh, the social the social structure, mores, political, everything that was going yeah, on. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, so, and, and so the, you know, the 71, uh, the 1971 miniseries illuminates that pretty well. So I would I'm recommend it to, if you have Apple TV. Yeah. I have to definitely check that out. Uh, that, that that's pretty cool. And, and that era, we, we talk about, we talked about this, this in the last, uh, episode or two, but like 68, 72, just such great, just such great melodic songs. Just, just I mean, songs that take you back to a just a feeling that we, it, 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 unless you're our age or a little bit older or whatnot, you don't understand just how good that feeling was hearing or listening to that stuff. Even even we talk we we talk about you know bands that were always kind of you know looked out of a little bubblegummy or not like Osmonds, but could have been if they wanted to be, or, you know, even the DeFranco family with their one hit was, it was just such a, such good music. You know, it was just fun, good time music. And, um, I don't know. Yeah. Today's stuff kind of take, takes away from that. It doesn't, it, the, the innocence is not there, I guess. And it, I can taste it. In, in, well, you know. You, you know, I mean, my position on that, this has always been like, Every generation deserves their own music. And right. while music is pro probably doesn't mean the exact same things to, uh, to the kids of today, it's still going to be tied in, in some ways to them coming of age, first kisses, um, other memories that will be attached to certain songs. Um, that will probably never go away. Uh, the only thing that I, I feel badly for... Uh, uh, with regard to you know the kids and music is you know so many of, of today's songs sound so similar and that's not that's not just me as an old guy just not getting it there have been studies done uh, 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 which have examined things like tempo variation of melody yes. and you know other other uh audible factors in songs and there's never been a time more bereft of any changes within a song as now. I mean, right. Yeah. And I was going to actually bring that up. I, 
I was reading an article the other day online from uh, something called spindiddy.com, and their headline was, Is Rock and Roll Dead? So I wanted to read what they were talking about. And did they really question whether rock and roll is either dead or on its way out? And their primary uh, angle to it is uh, the traditional guitar, bass, and drums that were the basis of all the music, really, 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, and you know, all that stuff is, is, has, has now gone away, where, the, where the, the, uh, the prominence is now all electronic. It's all push button. It's electronic this, electronic that. And as you said, the, the beats are the same. Many of the melodies are very, very similar. There's not a whole lot of difference through it all. So you, you get this... Um, you, you, you get the facts that, that, that everything today is starting to really kind of sound the same because they, they don't, you know, they, they don't broaden their horizons on, on the instrument wise, but they have a much bigger palette as far as electronic noises go. And they can make a lot of different sounds, but all the tempos, right. all the basic structures are kind of the same, you know? Um, it, it's, I mean, I want to say it's the same, but that would, you know, that would be in contradiction to what I was saying earlier about every generation deserves their own music. And I still yeah. feel that way. So if rock, if rock and roll, as we know it, is to go away, that's, that's okay. I mean, we have what we have. Right. And of course, as we know, in the underground there, of pop music, there are still plenty of bands doing what we really love. Right. Um, right. There are plenty. There are also rock and roll bands who are, you know are doing th things also that we that we love. Um, it's kind of a shame that there's no real variation in much music anymore. But on the other hand, the kids today have technology that we could never dream of. Right. Uh, whether right. whether or not that whether or not that's really advantageous, I suppose is up to the listener. Um, yeah. It hasn't created much that I like, but. You know, they get to play with some toys that, uh, you know, again, oh, we, sure. we couldn't have even dreamed of. Um, oh, oh, I know. I know. I would have given my left it arm. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> I would have given my left arm for a, an MP3 player and the three-hour drives in the back of my car going to my grandparents' house in the late 60s, early 70s. I would have given my left arm for just the, the Sony Walkman, which I didn't get till 19, what, 1979, 1980? You know, right? Because uh, all, all all I could do in a car was read a book and then get sick after about seventeen minutes. <laughs> I couldn't read in a car. I noticed that you were, I noticed that you were very adamant in qualifying your left arm. Yes, yeah. my right arm was already exhausted. <laughs> no, you, you you can't give that one away. God no. No, all uh, all because I was writing in my journal. Yeah, you know, I was journaling uh, at the oh, time. All right. Sure. I, I don't mean, know. You know. I don't you know what you were for, thinking about. You need it for one or two other things occasionally. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to talk about another book here. This isn't oh, a new know. book, but it's it's one that I just think is a whole lot of fun. And you may have this, Mark. I don't know. I'm yeah. sure of, some of our listeners do. Um, in the annals of books on the Beach Boys, there is not one book that is that is as entertaining as Heroes and Villains. The true, the true story of the Beach Boys. There should be quotes around the word true. Let me tell you. Uh, by Stephen Gaines. Um, it's a tell-all book. And uh, that's putting it mildly. Uh, right. There are some things in there that, you know, as, as a Beach Boys fan in the mid-80s, there were some revelatory stuff, let me tell you. Uh, the veracity of which, as I sort of alluded to earlier, is very much in question. But right. man, like I said, it is incredibly entertaining, and <laughs> some of it's probably some of it really is true. I would imagine. Um, are now, are you talking? You know, are you talking gray areas uh, as far as um, their actions, so to speak? Um, among among many other things, yes. Okay, all right. But here, right. here's what I find, uh, um, uh, and I recommend this book to to a lot of. people people right. out, out there, fa fans of the Beach Boys. It's just another perspective. And like I said, you will be enthralled. But the thing I find the most fascinating is there are de definitely a lot of heroes and villains in this book. So it was, right. it was very aptly titled. What I find, what I found very, very interesting was that 
Now, listen to me carefully here because I don't want anyone to get either offended or freaked out. But based upon what is in the book, okay, just based upon what is in the book, Charles Manson is probably only the fourth worst person. And you can <laughs> argue for him being fifth. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> Murray Will Murray Wilson's probably number one for all, right. all the thing all the abuses that he he uh, heaped upon Brian and it, and they're sure. very well they're very well recounted in here by a lot of different people. Uh, uh, Mike Love and uh, need I say more? Number two, <laughs> absolutely. Some people some people have associated the phrase number two with his number name two. <laughs> yeah. Um. Rocky Pamplin, who was, uh, 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 if John Park is listening, Rocky Pamplin was a man of five years. He, uh, that's what Playgirl at, uh, actually awarded him uh, when he, after he posed for, for the magazine. Uh, he was a guy, kind of a beefcake guy that uh, the Beach Boys hired to kind of keep Brian in line. And all kinds of nefarious stuff happened in, in Rocky's presence. Let's put it this way, but no doubt Rocky is number three. And, and what makes him even more egregious is the guy made no real contribution to anything, except maybe to Marilyn Wilson's love life, according to the book. <laughs> um, which, again, I, I don't know. I, the, it, maybe they did have an affair, but the way the, 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 way the thing is uh, illustrated in here, I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you've got three ahead of Manson already. And uh, you could argue for, for uh, Stan Love, Mike Love's brother, who played, uh, who played basketball, NBA basketball with a few teams. After he retired, yeah. well, I don't know if he retired or was forced to retire because he wasn't good <laughs> enough. After he stopped playing basketball, he, uh, he also was hired by the Beach Boys to take care of Brian. And he, too, well, he, be he beat the hell out of Dennis, he and Rocky, um, among other things. The worst thing Manson does in the book is threaten a few people. He never hits it. Well, all right, let me let me replace that. According to a quote, according to a quote, he quote beat the shit end quote out of some old man in Spawn's ranch. But even that pales in comparison, pales in comparison. to what Rocky did. <laughs> it, it does. Beyond that, he didn't murder anyone. He didn't orchestrate murders in in the book. OK, all the bad stuff that he did, the real bad stuff happens after the story with the Beach Boys. <laughs> so they don't talk about any of that. So right. in this book, Charles Manson is fourth, maybe even fifth worst. That's all he is. Wow. Get wow. the book. <laughs> get the book. Get the, get the book. If that, Heroes if that is not a Stephen solid Gaines. advertisement, I don't know what is. That is a freaking <laughs> ringing endorsement uh, <laughs> anyway no you'll be entertained uh it's it's been out of print for a while but you can find uh, pretty cheap copies on ebay and other places eBay, online. Yeah. It, it's not yeah. difficult go for it i'll tell you what uh, uh, what you got now Mark? what i was just saying you know we talked earlier you talk about the uh apple miniseries 1971 which uh, sounds really interesting uh, i wanted to bring up a, a, a fantastic documentary i watched a few months ago and then i bought the the book uh, that they put out uh, with it, but it's called Bathtubs Over Broadway. Um, there's a guy, Steve Young, who was a writer for Letterman on Letterman's late late night uh, TV show. And on the not Letterman the show- Not the quarterback. Not the quarterback, no. But I, th I hear he does the same same kind of thing. But uh, but this Steve Young um, would do segments on the on Letterman where they'd, they'd pull out these- these albums of just like the weirdest titles and music that they could find. And he started collecting albums of just strange stuff that, that he would come across. And he got into these um, what they call bathtubs over Broadway, but uh, he got into these record albums that were recorded as um, like convention uh, advertisements for, for big companies like general electric or, or Zenith, whatever it may be, but they would hold their conventions and actually put on almost like Broadway plays for everybody that would come to the convention. And these these well known songwriters would would would, would write the, these entire like shows. They're like Broadway shows, and then they'd press them to the vinyl, 
and hand out like a thousand copies to all the employees that would gather at the big convention. And they did this for like 25, 30 years from the early 50s wow. all the way up into the uh, the late 70s. So this Steve Young guy started collecting these things. He got he got passionate of collecting these things. And then he started wondering, well, who's making all this this really really good music, but it's all tied into the, the product brand. You know, so it'd be this big orchestration. It'd be like Xerox copiers and da, 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 you know, but it, it, a full show. So, um, so he, he started locating oh. all these people who were really good songwriters. And he, he put this whole documentary together called Bathtubs Over Broadway. And it's all about these industrial musicals and the vinyl that was pressed and who wrote the songs and he tracked down some people and interviewed them, and they were paid extremely well by these big corporations just to write the music to put these like uh, industrial shows on. And it was it's such a great documentary. I believe it's still on Netflix or something. I highly recommend if you just are interested in songwriting and and some different stuff, um, go check it out. It's wonderful. Now that you mention this, now that you've described it, I have seen this. It's been yeah. a few years. But and I really book. liked it. Don't they show him? Don't they show him going to record stores trying to find? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because so, some some of these things or... are extremely rare. Like it, let's say I was just I wrote down like he did for uh, General Electric, Ford, Dupont, McDonald's, big corporations. But if it was a smaller corporation that maybe only had three hundred attendees at the convention, but they still put together this show this industrial musical and maybe they only pressed 500 copies of the vinyl and something like that becomes extremely rare. If you're a collector like he is in trying to find copies of these things. Um, and some of them, there's one, I forget the title of the, of the one, but it, you know, it goes for a few thousand dollars on eBay for people who collect this stuff. And it's just, uh, it's, it's amazing. And the coffee table book that just came out about two months ago, which then shows all the different albums and gives shows the credits and who wrote what and how they did it and why is really, is really great. I highly recommend it. Bathtubs over Broadway. Check it out. You'll love it. You'll love it. If you're a music fan. So that's wow. Yeah. I, I, I want to see the book. Do you have it handy? Yes. Let me, uh, you entertain everybody with the song and dance. Let me go hold up the book. Hold on. I'll be right back. I, that, and I'm not yeah, going to the bathroom. Like, like, go. I mean, you know, this is this is live. This is a live podcast as we know it, as we do it. We don't care about rules. You know, we just uh, we just want to entertain everybody, or just entertain ourselves, for that matter. How glaring is this? Is it these this whole uh, this gaff right here? It's probably pretty bad, but you know, again. And I'm not going to let vanity stop me from from uh, presenting the uh, episode three. And uh, you know, Mark could have done it himself, but he was he he wouldn't do such a thing unless uh, you know, unless I was like absolutely too sick to too physically sick that is to do this. And uh, you know, the same would go for, for me. Oh my God, he le he's left me this long to entertain people. Well, let me see. Has anything interesting happened in the last couple of days other than my teeth uh, coming off of my denture? Well, the power's been out <laughs> all day, and it's freaking hot in my house right now. And I don't even want to look at what's going on in the refrigerator or freezer. And uh, I should have brought a beverage with me because now I'm really getting parched and I have nothing. And the power was supposed to be on, it was supposed to be restored a couple of hours ago and uh, nothing. So I have no idea when. And uh, nobody, by the way, if, you're, if your power's out and you ever go online and want to check to see, you know, the details, absolutely useless. I went to about eight different websites and they had nothing. Um, not even anything about the power outage itself, uh, let alone uh, when it was going to be uh, solved. So I finally found one. I finally found one. 
I think it was a, I don't remember which TV station it was. They had done a, a little report on it. And uh, they had said uh, that LADWP were going to have this restored by 4 o'clock. Well, it's 6.30 our time right now. So no such luck. All right, Mark uh, is back. Thank you. I am back. And uh, I, I found the, oh, I've got so many books. Uh, Kurt Vance says, sorry, I'm late. What did I miss? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> As usual, Kurt, you miss nothing. Because that, All right. that's what our podcast is always about. It's, it's exactly right. All right. It's, the book is called Everything's Coming Up Profits, The Golden Age of Industrial Musicals. Steve Young and Scott Murphy. Whoa. That looks nice. Yeah, it's where, uh, uh, where'd you get it? I got it on Amazon. It's not cheap. I think it's like a forty dollar book, but um, just uh, just I mean er everything inside huge, you know, huge book on just uh, songs to sell by and and and, and great things like that. Um, just 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 a. a Industrials for Coca Cola, industrials for just for the the saga of the dingbat. There's just all kinds of all kinds of great There's information. There's something about Edith Bunker in there. Yes, the dingbat, Edith Bunker. But um, on on the go with West clocks, uh, Western oh, electric nice. clocks, and it's just uh, you know it's it's, it's a huge, it's a huge book. It's just it's this is not very it's not small. And uh, do not play this side. <laughs> it's an a, it's an actual backside to one of the industrial albums. Do not right. don't put the needle down on this. But I, I highly Believe recommend. They needed it. that. They needed that. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm everything's check it coming out. up. Profits. You know what else the I golden want? age. Yeah. You know what else I want? I want the shirt off your Who? back. Literally, that oh. Bleaker Bob shirt. Bleaker Bob. Where did you get that? Well, you know they God damn it's they closed not. down. I, oh yeah, I, I got that about. I was up. I was up two Bleaker Bobs, which was not the original location, but the second location. Uh, right. About a month before they closed, I just you know I I had purchased so many albums from Bleaker Bobs back in the day that when I heard they were going out of business, I had to make a trip up. It was a it was one of those pilgrimage type things, and they had uh, t shirts. And I said, you know what? And you can probably find repros of this online, but I bought uh, three of them. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I bought three I'll of them. Bleaker Bob's, New York City. You bought three of yeah. them? I want one. I could, If you don't find it, I can send you one. Yeah. But All you're right. getting so skinny. Oh, I, you know, God, yeah. Mine would look like a dress on you. <laughs> you know? Well, then Jack Lambert <laughs> would tackle me because they ought to put dresses <laughs> on. He said last week. Um, there's a there's a classic gonna... record store, Bleaker Bob's. What a classic, classic record store. Ah. Well, I wanted to talk a little about that, but I, I, I was going to segue into really cool record stores in Manhattan back in the day. But our guest, uh, our guest next week, I think it'll be next week anyway, uh, Sal Maeda from, uh, or is it Maeda? I have to ask him. I've all, I've seen his I've seen his name spelled out on the, the on the albums of the bands he was in and on his new book which we'll talk about next week. Uh, he probably went to all of the record stores that I did back in 79, 80 and 81 in, in Manhattan. But Bleaker Bobs Bleaker Bobs was one of the ones that I went to probably the least because they didn't generally have the kind of stuff I was looking for. They, they didn't have the really deep collectibles right. um, that I, I went to other stores for that. And again, we'll talk about that when Sal is on. But uh, the one time I did go to Bleaker Bob's that I'll never forget was when uh, Get Happy by Elvis Costello came out. They, it was known that they were, they were going to have the import. Of course, that's what we said back then, not the UK pressing or anything. Right. They were going to the have the import uh, a week before anybody else did. Uh, the, way it, the way it was, uh, the UK version came out a week before the US, and they were going to have it the day that it was released in the UK. So naturally, I, in between classes at NYU, 
I ran over there and it was very, very close. It was on McDougal Street at the time. Um, I think between 5th and 6th, if anybody listening uh, says I'm wrong, I probably am. And let me know where it was. But yeah. I used to, yeah, I ran over there and, and got that thing uh, before it sold out, thankfully. Um, do you remember the difference between the UK and the, and the uh, US cover of Get Happy? No, no. Off the top of my head, no. The, the, U, the UK cover had that built-in wear around the label. Oh, okay. The so it looks, right. like, it, yeah, it looks like the cover was worn out. I don't believe the US version had that. And I think, I think all the reissues are well, maybe not all the reissues mm -hmm. of it on vinyl, but most of them they, they've uh, they've retained that. So the UK okay. have the wear, and the US don't, um, with some right. exceptions. Great album. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about Get Happy, but it's probably my yeah, great favorite album. Elvis Costello album. Great album. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's funny, uh, you know. Me uh, it's just one after the other. Soul, soul supreme. It's That's wonderful. It's a great album. I I went to Bleaker Bob's quite a lot in the the early eighties because um, at the time I was like a like a hardcore member of Danceteria and the five floors of dancing and and uh, dance dance pop type stuff. And I remember going to Bleaker Bob's and picking up a uh, a twelve inch forty five by a band called Animal Magnet. And their big dance, underground dance hit at the time was Welcome to the Monkey House. <laughs> and you don't, <laughs> you, don't see, you don't see this single pretty much anywhere. And I've got two copies of that vinyl. And wow. um, that's just a really good memory. Uh, and I used to be, I used to go to dance, and Dance and Terry, I don't know if you ever went to Dance and Terry in the 80s. Maybe that was uh, you know, a different time for you. But um, they had five floors. And each floor had a different kind of like thing going on. Um, the main floor, the Stray Cats filmed Rock This Town video there, um, uh, was a big dance area. I used to see Madonna before she was really Madonna dancing there at Dance Terry, just being Madonna. Um, but then they had like a floor that was wow. just all that was just all like black and white video monitors with the bar, and they would play movies like Eraser Head. Remember Eraser Head? I, don't know if you ever I remember saw it. it. Yeah. I never saw it. No. Biz bizarre movies that you know, once you were in there and partying for half the night, your your head would see a movie like you raise your head on on like all these monitors and you'd just be like, ah, <laughs> what's going on? Such a such a wild place and great memories now that we brought all this back up again. But I would find stuff like that. And actually, I think I think the manager of Kaja Gugu was the was actually in Animal Magnet. I have to try to recall the story, but I talked to him once a few years ago, and he didn't even so have a copy of it. So he wasn't too shy, shy. He wasn't what? too shy, shy. Hush. <laughs> and you know, and yeah, I confess to not knowing any other Kaja Gugu songs because I don't, too shy was enough. Did they have any other that, songs? That turned me off. <laughs> did they? I don't know if they had any other songs. Uh, maybe not, because I never heard them. <laughs> Apparently they had an album, at least one album. So. Apparently, okay, all right, yeah, yeah. Ah, there, no, there was no, a period. They, they definitely there was a period album. there in the eighties. You know, I had to, I had the, the big blonde hair, and it was mostly because all the good-looking women were dancing at the dance clubs. You had to go and and dance to bands like Our Daughter's Wedding with lawn chairs. What a great song! Yeah, a lot of great memories of that stuff too. I remember so. that song actually. Lawn chairs. Um, yeah, there, let me let me think of was was Hepno Beat by the Dynamic Hypnotics played at that at this club? I don't remember that one. No, no, no. You had uh, um, you had you had um, who did? I might like you better if we slept together. Um, oh yeah, might I know like the song. If we slept good. together, I might like you better. Oh, okay, let's see. I feel terrible for not knowing. I know. Ah, I'm going to keep If me up anyone all night. out there knows who did it, oh, I'm at yeah, 20% please. battery power now. Uh oh, that's so, okay. We're, we're, uh, we're 40. Once we get to 10%. We're 45 yeah, we, minutes into the show. We're going, we're doing well. We we're may doing very great, well yeah. make it to the hour, but if we don't, when we get to 10%, we should probably sign off because otherwise it'll just go, you know, 
blue, ah, blue there we right go. in the middle. We don't want that. Kurt, Kurt Vance oh, answered Romeo Void. Thank Romeo you. Romeo Void. Yeah. But it was funny because yeah, we actually, I actually saw Romeo Void play live. But we'd go to like places like Dan Santeria, you know, uh, early at night and then run over to like the Ritz or something and see 999 open up for, you know, the Alley or Alley Cats opening up for 999 or the professionals, whatever it may be. So I covered, I covered both ends of the spectrum. In, in one evening, it was uh, it was good hmm. times, man. Shoo, wow! I don't remember a thing. I don't know why. Dan for some reason, Danceteria reminds me of something that that happened when I was when I started college at Syracuse University. A bunch of us drove out to Niagara Falls. It was about two hours away, two hours west of us, and um, you know we we hung out there till like four a.m. Then we had to drive back to school. And I hadn't slept probably in about 36 hours. And I couldn't even drive. It was my car. And I had to ask my friend Jack, uh, who, did not, who did not have sugar loans. Uh, <laughs> I had to ask him. I did not. I, I had to ask him to drive. So we're driving. And, and my friends are saying the kind of shit that's probably not all that funny if, you're, if you've slept. But it's absolutely hilarious if you haven't. Um, you know, I mean, my brain was so devoid of oxygen. So they had got me, they had sort of got me on this path to laughter. And then all of a sudden we pass this place and I catch the sign. It's called, it's a gas station. It's called the Shamrock Gas Interior. And my friend Jack just has this real, had this really cool radio voice. He goes, Oh, it's the Shamrock Gasseteria. I don't know why. It put me away so much. I was I was pounding on the dashboard, laughing so hard. I literally could not breathe. And I'm not a laugher, really. Uh, but man, that day, that morning, I could not stop laughing. And he kept pouring it on. Uh, I mean, it's like I kept saying, I kept trying to say, stop, stop, because I couldn't breathe, literally. Uh, and then finally, he said something too obvious. He said, what do they do? Serve it on a plate? And that ruined it. Because <laughs> the subtlety was gone. The reason it was funny, of course, is because it was completely non sequitur. What do you mean gasateria? What the fuck is a gasateria? You know, and that's what was funny about the whole thing. And then he had, you know, he had to ruin it by... by by, uh, by taking it one subtlety with that one, <laughs> one step too far. One step too far, right? <laughs> but yeah, when you said danceteria, I thought of the shamrock. Did they? Did they have any shamrock danceterias in? Uh, no, in, uh, unfortunately, because uh, no. I, I would have loved to have gone to. Uh, I we we didn't we never went to the gasseteria, but there were many times <laughs> that, uh, and I don't. What? How can I? How can I say this in case my daughters watch this? What's the best? Um, well, there are many times we would uh, all my my good friends that were into going to dance in Terry the, these days. We worked in a restaurant, and we'd get off the restaurant at eleven o'clock at night on a Saturday night, and we could really get up to New York quickly in about an hour and fifteen minutes, and we'd usually get up there by about twelve thirty, dance till four thirty in the morning, five thirty in the morning get something to eat and turn around and get back to the restaurant in time to serve Sunday brunch, wearing the exact same clothes we left the night before and, and party all night in New York city. But there was this one time, well, probably more than once, but the one was memorable. <laughs> we're driving and we're just on our way to New York. We haven't even partied all night. And there was enough things in the car that took most of our senses to different places. <laughs> let's put it that way. I'll bet. Yeah, <laughs> we all, we all, there's four of us in the car. I'll never forget this. And my friend, Mike Mulqueen, if for some reason you tune in, I haven't seen you in forever, but I miss you, buddy. He was driving and Mike had his idiosyncrasies, but we pulled over because we all had to go to the bathroom and we were, we were on the turnpike and we, we hopped over a fence into a field, a little rest area, and we're, we were all going to the bathroom we jump back over the fence. We get in the car. We're driving, and of course, we you know we've got our feet up on the dashboard. Everybody's just doing whatever. All of a sudden, we're all going, "What the hell's that smell? What? Okay, who who farted? You know, and it's like something something's not right." Mike turns the dashboard lights on, and evidently, when we hopped over that fence, went into the field, it was filled with cow manure and cow cow dung, and we all stepped in it. Oh, so Ugh. back in the car on the turnpike. 
We turned the dashboard lights on. There was cow poop everywhere. Floor mats on the dashboard. So there was certainly no paradise by those dashboard <laughs> lights, that's for sure. And Mike was so livid, he pulled into the a, a, a turnpike rest stop gas station and tried to pay the toll ticket to the gas attendant. He was just, it was just the funniest thing on the planet. And I, and I always remember that when you talk about not being able to breathe because you're laughing so hard. Uh, that was one of those moments <laughs> on the way to, on the way to dance. Oh Italia. yeah. I can imagine. Well, again, if you haven't had much sleep, things are so much fun. I mean, I, I have never, I've never smoked a joint or hit, taking a hit off a box. And I've, but I've seen my friends do it and I've seen them crack up over absolutely nothing. <laughs> So I was probably going through a very similar experience. Have, I mean, there are different ways where oxygen leaves your brain oh, sure. or gets replaced by something sure. else. And I, <laughs> so I was probably experiencing something akin to being really, really fucking high. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll, and then you, you, and then the name Mull Queen reminded me that there was this when. When a bunch of us high school students were taking our driving test, there was this one inspector whose last name was Mulqueen, and he failed everybody. He was the living embodiment of the Grinch who stole Christmas. I mean, he even looked like him. Uh, and everyone was, would say, oh, my God, I, I hope you don't get Mulqueen. And then they'd snicker because they really hoped you did. So that you could <laughs> fail just like they did. Well, I had failed. I had failed my first two driving tests, and uh, I finally got my third one. It took a while, and wouldn't you know, Mulqueen was my inspector. And I thought, oh no, I'm gonna. Not only am I gonna fail, but I'm gonna have to face my friends <laughs> who are gonna crack up like nobody's business and be Mulqueen. So and you know. So I go through the test and he's very grouchy. You know, he's telling me what he's telling me what to do. And uh, I'm doing the you, I'm doing the parallel park. And he asked me, how old are you? And I thought, you know what? This is a good sign because I'm almost 18. So he's probably figuring, OK, let's give this poor guy a break. Uh, let's uh, let's give him his license. So I told him and you know, the rest of the test went fairly smooth. I thought I did OK. And he, he left, uh, as he left the car, he just said, you'll be notified by mail. <laughs> I couldn't quite make that out. So I said, excuse me, you, you, you'll tell me when? He said, you'll be notified by mail. And he slams the door. And I thought, oh, <laughs> shit, I failed. I failed. <laughs> but, wouldn't, but wouldn't you know it, I got, a few days later, I got the envelope. And in New York, and those of you who uh, lived in New York State in the mid-'70s, if you got an envelope that was thick, you failed because it had all the papers you needed to fill out for another test. If you got a, a, an envelope that was thin, you probably passed. Right. And this one was thin. And then I'm thinking, oh, my God, I made it. I made it. And sure enough, <laughs> I did. Of course, I drove over to, to, to one of the friends who said I was going to fail if I got malt weed. And I told him I failed. And uh, he started saying, ha ha. And I said, I passed, you motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, that. Oh, great so story. I, 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 may be the o I, may, I may be the only kid in the history of Clarkstown North High School who actually passed Pass. with Malqueen. Yeah. I don't know. That's good. Well, that's because you were older than everybody else. They felt bad. They felt they felt bad for you. I understand. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> well, the first the first test I des the first test I deserved to fail because I was nervous as hell. I couldn't do anything. So, whichever instructor I had then seemed almost afraid. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I I yeah I had all kinds of red marks on that, uh, uh, more than I ever had on a, a, a test in school in my life. You know, and was that now? Was that, that the written was test awful. or is that the driving test? No, the driving test. Driving um, test. And so, so I failed that one. Then the second one was scheduled for sometime in the winter, I mean, I, January maybe. I don't remember. And the conditions really sucked on the roads. Um, you know, I mean, you know how that is. Mm -hmm. and there, there, was, there was ice all over the place. And, you know, I'm slipping around. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, driving on ice. And I failed. And I, you know, I thought to myself, okay, that's cool. But what about all the other assholes who passed who didn't have to take their tests on ice? 
Maybe they maybe they would have fucked up on ice also. I mean, you know, let's do let's let's make this equitable, people. You know. But I got anyway. A- I got to tell you, when I took me. when I took my first driver's test and I passed it the first time, I had the very fortunate uh, uh, situation. I had a girlfriend at the time whose mom agreed to take me to the driver's test because they had remember those lay cars. It was they were called lay car L E C A R. They were a French. That sounds Im- familiar. Yeah. yeah, what were they? They were a French import car. What were those? They were they were just like little, ah. just two seaters. There wasn't even a back seat. They were so small that when I when you had to go into that that three point turn area where you were supposed to go in, pull your car, go and do that, I went I went right in and just turned completely around in this little lay car and pulled out. And the instructor looked at me and he said, "You lucky sob." <laughs> <laughs> if the if the car was so small, I could literally pick it up and move it and put it into the parallel parking thing if I wanted to. It was just so uh, it was great. Oh, that's I'll, so funny! I'll never forget that, Chris Blos, wherever you are in this planet. Uh, I would. Oh, Renault. There you go, Kurt Vance again. He is full of information. Renault had Le Car. The Renault Le Car, yeah. But what? But for you, since you had a girlfriend, then was the was the name of the car true to its word? Well, I lost you. Did you did you lay car? <laughs> uh, did, did you did you lay? There car? wasn't enough room in that lay car. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would have had to be lay out the there window. I would have had to had lay legs out the window. <laughs> Hey, you know, teenagers have done have done much, much more to, to get some action in the car. I might have I might Not have like fared have better making idea. love to the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'll never forget and with that. that yep. I just saw, I just saw that I'm I just saw that I'm under ten percent. So we should probably say our goodbyes. We almost made it. Yeah. Uh, which no. I think is phenomenal given the, the situation. And uh yeah, I had a lot of fun Indeed. as usual. It's always Hopefully great. we'll get Sal on next week. That'd be nice and, to have uh, Sal made we'll a talk about Sal made a next week live would be nice. We're not guaranteeing anything. We'll be able to talk about it. There's book. a yeah. there's a very big possibility, so we're gonna try. He, he he's got a he's got a great new book that uh that a lot of you record collectors out there need to, to know about and need to buy. But until great. then, uh hopefully yeah. the power will come on because this kind of sucks. But yeah. I'm glad we did. We're able to do this, and hopefully next week I'll have some actual tea. new choppers o- o- over here. And we'll either have right. Sal Meta on, or we're going to have uh, my old girlfriend's mom on with her lay car. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for uh, <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Material Issues episode number three. You, it will be archived on. Facebook and on YouTube, and you can hear the podcast audio only on podbean.com. Just look up material issues. David, good to see you, my my friend. We'll talk to you next week. You too, Mark, as always. Have a great rest of the week. Have a great night, everybody. Enjoy everyone the week. out there as well. All right. Good night. Good night. <laughs>